So yeah, we're going to talk about raised beds tonight. Um, we do a lot of gardens here at Community Gardens, as you might guess. We work with a lot of school gardens, a lot of community organizations that do gardens. And for many, many of those, in fact, most of them, we do raised beds. And one of the reasons you'll find out is because they make it so much easier to grow. It's easier to be successful and have a really wonderful garden. So we're going to talk about it today. And um, for a little preview on this presentation tonight, at first I will talk about building raised beds because a lot of people want to know how to build their own raised beds. And then we'll talk about growing in raised beds. So we're going to talk about both of these tonight. So, you know, and one of the reasons that people are interested is they want to know why, what's the big deal about raised beds? What's so good about them? What are the advantages? And so here they are listed for you. Um, they give you good drainage, which is helpful around here because we have lots of clay soils that don't drain very well. So in the raised bed, you'll have much better drainage. And of course, you'll have good soil, assuming that you go ahead and fill up your raised beds with a really good soil mix. And we'll talk about what that means exactly, but um, we're starting off with a really nice eight inches of good soil, and it just helps your plants get off to a good start. The other thing is it helps your soil warm up quicker, which is useful in the cool springtime when we're waiting for the soil to warm up so that seeds will germinate. It also can be just a physical barrier um, for actually keeping out, uh, believe it or not, rabbits, although rabbits will climb up into raised beds if they're interested enough. But a, a big factor is soil compaction um, because the whole idea with raised beds is you are not walking on the raised bed ever. And you know, in a regular garden, you're walking on the path, you're walking right next to your plants all the time, and you're always pressing down on the soil and compacting it, which makes it hard. It also squeezes out the air pockets, which are important for plant roots. So um, not walking on your raised bed will keep it nice and loose and reduce that compaction. Also, raised beds are accessible after the rain, uh, which is important, especially we do a lot of school gardens um, and that way they can actually go out and be in the garden, but you with your home garden can go out into your raised bed. And if you have something on your path, uh, you're not walking in the mud, you're not walking and pressing down the soil in the mud and everything. So you can actually go out and pull some weeds or pick some vegetables right after a rain, whereas in a normal garden, you have to wait for it to dry out a little bit. You can build your raised beds on a slope if your ground is not perfectly level, which is helpful sometimes. It's also just easier on your back. You're not bending over as far. Um, and then also you can actually put raised beds in places where you wouldn't normally think about having a garden. We've actually built some raised beds on parking lots. I uh, usually we make them a uh, double stall, double tall, like we'll put two raised beds on top of each other so we'll have lots of soil. Um, or, you know, a gravel area or a really rocky area, you can put raised beds in and still get nice results. Disadvantages mainly are cost. Um, you know, it costs money for the lumber, it costs money for the soil. Um, although there's some ways to get around that a little bit, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And also, it's a lot of work to build the raised beds and fill them. Filling them involves moving lots of dirt. So it's a big project. It's not something that you can just do real easily. So you don't want to say, start off and say, I'm going to build, you know, 10 raised beds in a weekend. It's just too big a project. So we'll talk a little bit more about building and all that stuff in a little bit here. But before you do any kind of building, you want to plan. So just like a regular garden, you want to pick a good location. And we'll talk about all these different things, but also figuring out what size the beds are going to be, how many, what kind of building materials are you going to use, what kind of soil you're going to put in, and then how to estimate the cost. As far as choosing that location, it's just like a regular garden. You want to pick a location with full sun because your vegetables will do best in full sun, especially for the fruiting vegetables like tomatoes and peppers and squash and cucumbers. You also want to be close to a water source because you're going to be having a hose reach out to your garden and you don't want to have to go any farther than necessary uh, to turn the water on and off and all that kind of stuff. So. And just close proximity to where you are. You know, if your garden's nearby in your backyard, you're more likely to spend more time in it if you don't have to walk real far to go out to the garden every time you want to do something. 
The other thing is if there's areas in your yard where there's bad soil or um, if you're working on an empty lot, there might be some bad soil areas, some really rocky areas or something. Obviously avoid that or heavy clay. And also you want to avoid any kind of heavy weed, invasive weed cover. Traditionally, we're thinking about things like Bermuda grass, which is a really bad invasive grass, just because that means you'll be fighting it in your raised bed or even in a regular garden too, because that Bermuda grass will try to take over and grow everywhere. All right, so as far as determining what size of raised beds, they come in all sizes and people make them all sizes, but there are definitely some recommendations. And one of the big things is width. How wide should you make it? The whole idea, remember, is to not walk in the bed. So you're going to be doing all the work from the side. So you need to be able to reach towards the middle from either side. So for most people, four feet is a good number to make your beds wide. That's how wide you should make them. Um, if you make them wider than that, you may have a hard time reaching to the middle and you'll be tempted to step in the bed and compact the soil. If you have difficulties in reaching far, or if you have children, sometimes we're working with preschoolers, we'll make the beds not so rise. We'll make them uh, like three feet wide. So that makes it just easier to reach the middle. But four feet is a good average for most people. As far as length, um, usually think about making them the length of lumber boards. So lumber typically comes like eight feet, 10 feet, or 12 feet. You can actually get lumber that's longer than 12 feet, but it's really hard to handle. It's very expensive. And then if you make your beds too long, then you have a long way to go around them because remember, you're not going to be stepping into those raised beds. You can also make them different height. Um, you know, you can raise them up extra tall. You can double stack or triple stack. We'll talk some more about some reasons why you might want to do that. Um, but typically the average raised bed is eight inches tall. So you might use eight inch tall lumber. And if you have really good soil, maybe you could get by with less. You might use six inch tall lumber. But six to eight inches is common height for most raised beds. And then as far as to how many, I do advise people to start small, meaning don't start with the whole number, great big number of raised beds. I mean, we tell this to individuals, but also to groups. Um, to build some, see how you're doing, and then see if you want to build more. You can always build more later um, and add beds gradually. Also, the number of beds may definitely be limited by your budget because there is cost involved. Although you can make some raised beds that are not as expensive, and we'll talk about how to do that here in a little bit. So let's talk about building materials. So what are you going to use for the size of your raised beds? There are different materials, um, obviously lumber, but some people want to try some alternatives. And one alternative would be concrete blocks, sometimes known as cinder blocks. Probably the downfall for these is, um, you know, you have to put them in place and move around a little bit. Some um, also they are wide, so that cuts down on the space. Like this bed right here in this picture, they made it still about four feet across, but that means the center part is not very wide, so you have less growing space. Some people will utilize the little um, holes in the cinder blocks to put plants in, and that's, that's fun to do. It's kind of cute, but it's always not very practical. And also that means you can't really sit there. It's kind of handy to have that space to sit on or to lean on when you're working on the raised bed. So cinder blocks are not my favorite. Um, some people like them, uh, but they are, you know, I think they're kind of difficult to work. Some people want to use landscape blocks, and we have a large children's garden here at the community gardens called the Beanstalk Children's Garden, and we use landscape blocks. It's really nice for making tall raised beds. You can do free form shapes with curves and bends in them, like you see in there on the left. Um, this person here in this picture on the right has made a, a landscape block bed. They built it right up against their house which I don't recommend because it means on the backside that the soil is right up against the house, not too good of an idea. But um, you don't necessarily have to go this high. If you want to make them extra high because you need accessibility, that's fine, but obviously that makes the cost higher. Um, typically these, these blocks are like four inches or six inches tall. 
and two of them makes a really nice height for a raised bed. So you don't have to have them that tall. Um, but typically, if people think about using lumber for the size of their, their raised beds, and there's different types of lumber. You can use untreated lumber, uh, pine, typically, like if you go to a lumber yard, that's what you'll find. Um, you can also use cedar, and cedar comes in a couple of different versions. One is rough cedar that's a little more coarser, and um, it's just the, the texture is rougher. It hasn't had its final planing. Um, or there's smooth cedar, which has been planed down to be smooth edges. Um, so most lumber has been pluned, has, has been planed and is smooth, sorry. Um, but treated lumber um, is another option, and that's typically made out of pine, and that's lumber that's been treated with a chemical preservative so that the wood won't rot very quickly. If you use the untreated lumber, it's going to rot very quickly, usually in about two or three years. If you use cedar, it's longer lasting because it's more resistant to rot, but it will rot eventually and start, you know, the bed will start looking bad after about 10 years. Um, so it doesn't last forever. Treated lumber typically lasts 25, 30 years, so it will last the longest. Um, the old types of treated lumber used to have some toxic chemicals in them, some arsenic in them, which was not good. And so they stopped making that. Now it just has some copper mixtures in it. It's considered safe for children, considered safe for um, growing vegetables in, uh, but some people are still kind of cautious about it and prefer the cedar. As far as thickness, uh, recommended two inches thick lumber um, rather than just one inch thick lumber. One inch thick lumber sometimes will bow when it has the heavy weight of the soil. So Generally, two inches is better. So if you're going to make your bed six inches or eight inches tall, you're going to use like either two by eights or two by sixes. And then you can buy that in different lengths. Like I said, typically eight feet, uh, 10 feet, 12 feet are the common lengths for the lumber. Uh, another option is um, to buy a kit. And they use the kits are typically made out of plastic lumber. Um, you can buy them at places like Home Depot, Sam's Club, things like that. You can order them online. You can see this one here is kind of a, a little triple stack um, with like three boards high. Um, it's got these little joints that you then stick the plastic boards into. So it's easy to assemble. And of course, the plastic will last a long time. And some of them are actually made out of recycled plastic. So it's a good choice for um, raised beds. Um, so that's an option uh, They can be moderately expensive. And typically, you're not going to find real long boards with plastic lumber. Uh, these look like they're about four feet, but it looks like you maybe put two of them together. Uh, so there is a, another option, and that's using no materials for the sides, no lumber, no blocks, no plastic lumber. And that's where you just merely heap up the soil into a mound. Uh, low cost, no cost, because you don't have to buy anything. You're just using the soil. Um, it is labor intensive because you're basically shoveling out the path. Um, so people will like dig in the garden, they'll dig out the soil from where you want your path to be, measure it off, and then you'll shovel that into here. And that will make your raised beds a little taller. Um, of course, you know, with the rain and, you know, watering and things like that, the sides will kind of collapse a little bit. And so at the end of the season, you may need to reshape that a little bit. The sides are sloped. If you make them real tall, that means you're going to lose some space. I definitely recommend mulching. That will help those sides of those beds not to wash away. They won't have uh, erosion problems so much. But this is a very feasible um, way to make raised beds. Um, you know, people like using the lumber. It looks nice and everything. But you certainly don't have to. And um, it certainly works fine. Um, all right, so what type of soil to use? Um, you can use existing soil, and that's kind of like what I was talking about. Here you see this gentleman, a uh, friend of mine here, Marty Kraft, is um, shoveling some dirt from the, the, where his path area and just using the existing soil. So when you do this kind of raised bed, you don't have to bring in soil. Uh, there's still a lot of shoveling involved, but you don't have to go out and purchase soil. 
Um, I would recommend if you are going to do that, though, at least you might add some compost to enrich it and make it even better. Um, some people want to buy soil in bags, and you can certainly do that by going to a, a garden center, um, you know, or a, you know, a Home Depot or whatever. But it takes a lot of bags of soil to fill up raised beds. It's an expensive way to do it. And the other thing is the soil isn't necessarily always the best in bags. So if you're going to buy some soil, I recommend actually purchasing soil in bulk. And what that means is you're going to buy by the truckload. And so if you're going to just do one raised bed, you maybe don't need very much. Maybe a pickup truckload will do it. Um, and you can just go do that yourself. Um, the thing is, you want to purchase from a reputable company, not just you know somebody who has a sign out saying, you know, topsoil for sale. Um, you want to buy from a good company. And the really best companies are soils that will sell you a mix. Uh, what we like to use in our raised beds is a mixture of half compost, half topsoil. So it's 50% compost, 50% topsoil. So that means there's going to be a lot of organic matter in there, and you will have really good soil, and it will be rich, and it will produce well for you. I can almost guarantee that people will have success if they use a 50-50 mix. Um, we have a company that we've been buying from for a while now. Um, they're out in Belton, it's called KC Compost, and they make a really good compost and really good topsoil mix. And it's been really, really good for us. Um, anyhow, they're available. You can contact them, look on their websites, just KC Compost, you can find them. Um, so typically you're getting a truckload and um, you need to figure out how much soil you're gonna need. So in order to estimate that, you know, soil is sold by the cubic yard, which means the cubic yard is three feet by three feet wide, by three feet tall, by three feet long. You think of a square like that, and that's considered a cubic yard. That cubic yard contains 27 cubic feet. Um, so there's a formula for calculating cubic yards, and it's not that hard. Basically, you're figuring volume. So you're taking the length in feet times the width in feet times the height in feet. And then you divide it by 27 because that's how many cubic feet are in a cubic yard. So for a, a standard size raised bed, which the ones we usually make are four feet wide and they're 12 feet long and they're eight inches high, that's going to be four feet times 12 feet times two thirds of a foot because eight inches is two thirds of a foot tall. And that's going to give you 32 cubic feet. And so then you divide that by 27 and it gives you 1.2 cubic yards. I do like to round up just a little bit. So you might round up to a yard and a quarter uh, for one of these raised beds. So let's say you were getting four raised beds, you'd want to order five cubic yards. Now, if um, all this math is confusing to you and math has never been your strong subject, that's okay. Usually the companies will help you figure it out. You can tell them how big your raised beds. Um, I know that KC Compost actually has a little calculator thing on their website, and you just plug in the numbers, like how long and how wide and how deep your raised beds are, and it will do the math for you. So it makes it really easy. And then you can figure out how much soil you're going to order. As far as estimating cost for lumber, um, you know, it depends on what kind of lumber you use, obviously. Um, the cedar is the most expensive, and then the, the treated lumber is the next kind of in between, and untreated lumber um, is the cheapest lumber. So um, just to get an idea of lumber cost here, four foot bed by 12 foot long raised bed made out of cedar, and then you're going to fill it with 50-50 compost um, mix. The lumber boards are going to be about 100 and $35 for those boards. Um, and then your soil is probably going to be like another $35 to $40, depending on your delivery fee and how much soil you're ordering. So, you know, in the neighborhood of $170, $180 for a raised bed. Here you can see the boards that you're going to need. You're going to get two 12 foot long beds up here. Um, there's two of them. And then you're going to get one eight foot long bed here. And you're going to cut that one in half, and that will be the ends. So these are the sides, 
the length, and this is going to be the end cut in half. And here's what that looks like. That's not an extra board that you need to get. It's just it shows you what the size is for a four foot bed. So anyhow, that's your, your lumber cost. And we actually have a little guide sheet that can help you with your lumber cost estimating um, if you're interested in that. As far as estimating the cost of that soil, um, that 50-50 mix runs in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 dollars for a cubic yard um, so if you're going to get say four raised beds and you have five cubic yards that's going to be about 200 dollars and then there'll be a, a delivery cost on top of that could be anywhere between 60 and 100 dollars so it's, it's a lot for a truckload um, an option would be to pick it up yourself if you have a pickup truck so if you're only doing one raised bed or two maybe, it makes perfect sense to get a pickup truck, either you have one or you can borrow one from a friend. You can get about a cubic yard in the back of a good size, full size pickup. Um, it is a lot of work shoveling it, but you're gonna have to shovel it anyhow. If you have it dumped in your yard, you gotta shovel it to put it into a wheelbarrow. Um, with your pickup truck, sometimes you can actually drive your pickup truck right up to where your raised beds are and just shovel it directly in. Um, you know, when you're going to use lumber and bulk soil, there's just some things to be thinking about. So these are kind of the steps for that. Um, you're going to prepare the ground and get ready. You're going to be connecting the boards. Um, how are you going to fasten them together? Think about that. Um, actually cutting the lumber. Um, and then, of course, placing the beds once you've built them. And then filling the beds with the soil mix. And then, of course, you want to level the beds. Then you got to think about what your paths in between the beds are going to look like and what are you going to use for your path material. So we're going to talk about all these things here as we're building these raised beds. As far as preparing the soil ahead of time, um, I like to remove the sod. Um, we sometimes often will just put raised beds right on top of sod. <coughs> Excuse me, people worry about that lots of times. They're afraid the grass is just going to grow right up into the soil. And if it was Bermuda grass, which I've talked about, which is very invasive and spreading, that could do that. But most grasses aren't. The typical lawn is either fescue or bluegrass or um, rye, and um, that will not grow up through the raised bed soil. So you can put the raised bed right on top. That grass sod will decompose and become compost in the soil root. I mean, the plant roots will actually grow right through it eventually. Um, but I actually like to remove the soil. And you know, you can do that by cutting the sod off and removing it. It's a lot of work. Um, another easier way to do that is to smother it. And that means ahead of time, um, at least six months ahead of time, if you're going to do it in the fall, you could put down um, either a heavy layer of mulch, like straw or grass clippings. Um, you could also put down cardboard to smother it out. Anything that will smother the grass. Uh, if you leave it on the grass for a few weeks, a few months, it will kill the grass and eventually you'll pull that off and you'll have bare soil underneath. And it makes it easy to, um, you know, put your raised bed down. I actually do like to um, prepare the soil right underneath where the raised bed is going to be because um, that gives you two layers of good soil assuming that you have some good topsoil there. But in any case, loosening it will make it easier for the roots to penetrate. It will make drainage better. So once you actually figure out where your raised bed is going to go, you can use like a fork or a shovel and spade it up or fork it up. Uh, and then if you want to rototill it too, you can do that. And that'll make that soil underneath nice and loose. You can put your raised bed on top of it. A lot of people ask about putting landscape fabric underneath the bed because they're again they're afraid that plants are going to weeds are going to grow up underneath and I do not recommend that um, it just makes it harder for the plant roots to go down farther because they can't penetrate through that landscape fabric. As far as connecting the boards um, we'll talk about cutting the boards in a minute but it is good to think about how you are going to connect them because that will make a difference how you cut the boards. Um, the first time I built some raised beds many years ago, I just simply cut them with straight sides and butted them up to each other. And then we used screws to fasten them together. And it seemed like a good idea at the time, but what happened is 
you know, after a couple of years with the weight of the soil in there, um, the screws started coming loose and they just started falling apart and had to rebuild all the beds. Um, so there's different ways to do it. You can put um, brackets in to fasten the boards together. You can buy L brackets at your hardware store. They're moderately expensive and you have to put, you know, usually two on each corner, but that certainly can help hold your beds together. Um, you can also do notching of the corners. And if you look in this um, raised bed on the picture on the right, you can see how it's been notched, cut out, so that they're overlapping each other. And then you put like either two nails or two screws in the side. So here's two nails, and then you put two nails down here. So you have two nails going two different directions. So I learned this from a gentleman who used to work for us, who was a carpenter and could do many things, but um, he figured out how to put raised beds together so they wouldn't fall apart. Uh, they may still get loose after a while. Sometimes it's boards warp or something, but much less likely to have any problems. They generally stay together for a very long time. Um, so then you put them together. We also like to actually drill holes in them to make it easier to put the nails or the screws in. But yet another way to connect to raised beds is to buy a raised bed connector block, which they now sell at Home Depot. It's this concrete block. This one is uh, double stacked, so it's got two blocks on top. But they're typically six inches high. And then they have these notches in the concrete. And you just basically put down two blocks, one over here and one over here, and just slide a board in, and it's all fastened together. This also makes it easy to take it apart um, if you want to later. Um, so it really is very handy. And the blocks are heavy. They hold the, the boards in place. And so it really is a really simple way. It does make your corners larger, so you have to be careful with your mowing or whatever. But it certainly seems like this could be a really helpful thing for people. It makes it easier to build raised beds. As far as cutting the lumber, you know, if you're going to do the notching thing, you want to make a little pattern for yourself so you can cut notches in them easily. Um, you know, there's different kinds of saws. You can use a circular saw, but then you have to finish it off a little bit with like a a regular, like a bow saw or something. Um, I know here at our office, we like to use what's called a sawzall. Um, you know, it's a, it's a reciprocating saw, which makes it easy. At home, I personally like to use a saber saw. It's really pretty easy to do, and you can, you know, cut nice, nice straight edges, and it's just easy to cut that notch in there if you're going to do that. If you're just going to use the landscape blocks, like we did in the previous picture, um, you don't, if you're, you're, you're four by 12 boards, you don't have to cut them at all. So really it's just these boards right here, the end boards, which is your eight foot board that you cut in half. So that's just making one straight cut, which is pretty easy to do. In fact, that's something you can actually pay them to do, or sometimes they'll do a free cut for you at the, the home improvement store. Uh, just tell them you want your eight foot boards cut in half and leave your 12 foot boards. And then after that, you wouldn't have to do any cutting. So that would make it very easy. Um, if you are going to cut um, treated lumber, I recommend that you wear a dust mask because you do not want to be inhaling that sawdust. It's going to be flying around in the air, and it's not good to inhale that sawdust that has the copper chemical wood preserving in it. So that's probably the most dangerous thing about that, using the treated lumber. And again, I do recommend if you're going to do the notching thing to drill little pilot holes that will just make it slightly smaller than the screws or the nails that will make it easier to put them in. So sometimes it's a good idea to build beds, special beds for special situations. And special situations might be for people with disabilities, um, even just senior citizens. It's nice to make beds taller. Um, um, so there's just lots of reasons why you want, might want to make taller beds. Um, in this upper left-hand corner, you'll see some beds that are actually raised up on legs. Um, if you're going to do that, you have to use a special soil mix that is not so heavy. Just regular soil with that 50-50 mix can get very heavy. So in this case, you'd want to use more like a potting soil type material so that the, the bed can hold that weight. Um, especially once it's been watered, it will be very heavy. Um, these beds typically can't be very wide. Um, it is nicer for people with wheelchairs. They can, you know, 
access them easily. Um, these beds down here right below are not that tall, but they do have a nice bench seat right on them and they're raised up pretty high. And so like you can actually, if you have mobility issues, hard for you to bend over, um, you can actually just sit there right on the edge of that bed and do your weeding, harvesting, watering, mulching, everything. Um, here's some that we put in at a senior citizen's apartment complex in Bandy, Missouri. Um, this one is a triple stack, so it's a very tall bed. Um, it takes a lot of soil to fill that up, but you have a really nice bed, so you'll get really good results from the, the crops growing in those extra tall beds. It also just makes it so much easier you don't have to bend over so far um, for picking and planting. Down here you see uh, someone in a wheelchair that's actually doing some raking from a raised bed. This one's only a double stack, and that might seem kind of low, so it might be hard for planting, but actually, if you're planting some things that get taller in there, like um, squash or peppers or um, especially tomatoes, and you're picking the tomatoes, this would be just the right height for someone in a wheelchair because if it makes the bed too tall, they would not be able to reach very high up into the tomato plant to pick the roots. As far as placing your beds, um, the question will come up, how far apart you want to place that? How much space are you going to leave in between? Um, if it's your home garden and you don't have very much space, you can put them much closer. You just want to leave enough room so that you can get down them easily and maybe leave enough room so that maybe you can get a wheelbarrow through there um, or a little cart of some kind if you're bringing something in or out. Um, but if you've got more space, you might as well give yourself a little more space for your path, make it easier. Um, if you're using um, the garden for any kind of group function, like let's say it's a school garden or you know multiple people will be working in the garden, it's good to have wider, wider paths to make it easier for people to get around them. Um, you'll see also sometimes um, that uh, the mowing, you know, people will have grass growing in between the bed. And that's what they choose for their path. Um, so um, you want to make it the, the path wide enough so that a lawnmower can get there. You'll see some wider paths here in a little bit. We'll show you. Um, so when I'm actually putting raised beds out, I like to use stakes and string to make sure I can get my, my raised beds all in a nice row so they're all lined up nicely. Um, and then, like, if you're going to have three foot path in between, I'll get like two three foot bed, two three foot boards, and I'll put them down in between the beds and lay them down and then slide the bed over when it doesn't have soil in it and use that to be my spacing so that the path will be exactly the same, three feet, all different, all along the sides there. And that just makes it easier so you don't have to measure each time if you use that spacer board um, whenever you're putting your raised beds next to each other. As far as filling the beds, um, you do want to get the soil dumped as close as possible, just because if you're going to be wheelbarrowing, um, you know, wheelbarrows with full of soil are heavy. It's going to take a lot of wheelbarrows to fill them up. So the closer you can get to your raised bed, the better. It's also good to get helpers. Uh, you want to get helpers, and the more people you have, the easier it'll be, the faster it will go, you'll get less tired. You're going to be using wheelbarrows and shovels and dumping into the beds. Uh, and I recommend that people tip them sideways. And I think we'll see some video on that. But if you tip them straight ahead, it's really easy to bump into the bed and move it out of alignment. And then you'll have to measure again to make sure it's in the right place. Um, so if you tip them sideways, it's easier on your back. And you'll see that in the video. We'll show you a we'll short video here in a little bit. Um, you know, while you're filling it, you definitely want to avoid, you know, bumping into it with your wheelbarrow because you just want to keep it in the proper place. The spacer boards will help you, you know, make sure that you still got it in the proper alignment. And I recommend people fill the corners first, and that will help hold it in place. And then the other thing is you're eventually going to fill it completely full. Sometimes people will only fill it like half full or three quarters full, but you might as well fill it all the way full, and then the soil will settle a little bit, and then you can level it with the rake after you get it mostly full. As far as leveling the beds, um, I recommend using a 
three foot level to check the level. Um, you want to raise up like the low corners and put the level on it, and that'll tell you how much soil you'll need to fill in underneath there. Uh, Tamp the inside edge of the bed, with, you know, to firm the soil a little bit. And basically, each bed is going to be level with itself because um, you're going to have changes in elevation in your garden, might have a slight slope. And you don't want it to follow the slope. You want it to be like a little terrace. And each raised bed will be, you know, level by itself. And if you have very much slope, they'll almost be kind of like your stair step down. All right, here's the little video we're going to watch. Um, it's about one minute. Um, it's speeded up, so it goes very fast. But it gives you an idea of what it's like when you're building a raised bed and putting them together, placing the bed, shoveling. So we'll just see what this looks like. This is at one of our schools. So there you see we're building the beds, hammering them together. Um, it's easy to do, especially if you drill those holes. Even kids can do it. It's really fun to have the kids do this, and they're helping to build the garden. And so then it's their garden. Here they're making some double stacks, so they're putting two of them on top of each other. Lots and lots of shoveling involved. That's why you want lots of helpers if you're doing especially very many raised beds. And that way it works good. Everybody shares in the work. And there you can see they're dumping the, the soil into the wheel, into the raised bed, tipping them sideways, it makes it easy. And then just flip it on over and lift it out and just move the wheelbarrow back and go and fill it up again. So um, this won't go quite this fast. This obviously is speeded up, um, but um, it shows you how to do it. And here's what they look like when they're all done. You have beautiful raised beds and they'll be ready to plant. So um, I think there's some more uh, video of our schoolyard gardens on all of our um, YouTube channels on our website. So you can access those. All right, so um, as far as like what kinds of options for your paths, um, one option is to use turf or grass. And a lot of people don't want to do that because then they think they have to mow it and that's true. Um, so, but you know, it does work good if you want to have it mowed. Uh, so then just make sure it's wide enough for the mower to get through and you will need to use a weed eater, but it definitely makes it usable, um, you know, to use the garden right after a rain because you're just walking on grass, you're not walking in mud, eliminates muddy shoes, you know, coming back into the classroom or coming back into your house. The grass can work really well. It just involves mowing, so there is some maintenance. Another option is mulch. Here you can see some raised beds. And of course, we recommend mulching the raised beds themselves. But um, also, you can mulch the paths, and then you don't have to worry about walking in the mud. And um, it will just make it nice for walking on. Um, you can use straw. You can use grass clippings. Either one of those work great. I do not recommend wood chips. And the reason I don't is because um, Wood chips uh, tend to degrade, and after a while, they become almost like compost. And weed seeds will drift in and start growing in there. Um, you know, if there's weeds underneath, they'll grow up through the wood chips. We did a, a, a large garden years ago and used wood chips for the paths, and we spent more time weeding the paths than we did weeding the garden. And we put more wood chips on top, but the weeds would just keep coming in all the time. So, not a big fan of wood chips. Also not a big fan of rubber mulch. They use that sometimes on playgrounds. Um, basically it's like ground up tires that have been dyed to look almost like bark chips. Um, but there's some toxicity issues. People are concerned about the ground up tires, um, you know, with, with the rubber mulch. And also um, they just don't decay. So again, you, it's gonna get mixed up with the soil in your bed. So um, just not a good idea. Um, another option would be landscape fabric. You can buy landscape fabric and just put it down. It's the type of thing that people put down around their shrub bed, around their house to keep weeds down, and then they'll put bark chips on top. You can buy, um, I recommend getting commercial grade fabric. It comes in different widths, like two, uh, three feet wide, four feet wide, five feet wide. If you want to, then you can cut it in half to make the right size half you want. Uh, you can pin it down using little landscape fabric pins, little anchors. Um, then cut the fabric to fit. 
Uh, if you want to, you can put mulch on top, straw if you want to, and that will just help keep the weeds down. Um, other option, we've even had some gardens put down um, burlap coffee bags. You can contact the coffee shops. They often get the, the coffee comes in these big burlap bags. They're trying to get rid of them. You can put that down just like a, a fabric, you know, landscape fabric, and that will smother out the weeds and makes a nice walking path. Um, the, the burlap will eventually decompose, um, so you might have to put a layer down, a new layer down eventually. But we have some gardens that are doing very well with their, their coffee beds. Still another option would be paving stones. Uh, paving stones are pretty expensive. Um, in fact, very expensive uh, to buy the stones and to get the labor to put them down. So um, very labor intensive and of course drainage issues. There's no place for the water to go unless you slope the, the paving stone slightly. Uh, like out in our children's garden, we have a slight slope and so the water all drains to the bottom and goes out. The other thing, it makes it hot because uh, the bricks absorb a lot of heat. So it makes it not as pleasant for being out there sometimes. But if you do need wheelchair accessibility, especially in a group garden situation, paving stones can be really nice. Um, so that's building your raised garden bed. But as you know, once you build anything, there's always maintenance involved. Um, you know, occasionally you'll have to add some more topsoil. Uh, so when you do that, I recommend getting a, a mix of at least the 50-50 again, or you can add straight compost. And even if your beds aren't sinking the soil, that organic matter will decompose after a while. So it's good to add a little bit of topsoil, excuse me, a little bit of organic matter maybe every other year, maybe every third year or so, uh, just to keep lots of organic matter in the soil. The other thing is you might have some maintenance to do, repairs on the lumber the corners. Um, you can see this bed here on the left, you know, it's starting to deteriorate, it's coming apart. So they put a corner brace on there and some screws in there. So you can do that, that will hold it together. Um, here's what it looks like before. You don't wanna let it get to be too hard, too far gone it's hard to put back together and if it rocks too much um, you know the boards may not hold together very well so you know definitely try and catch it you know when they're just starting to come apart all right so growing in the raised beds we've built them now we're going to talk about growing in them so these are kind of the different steps for growing in the raised beds preparing the soil making a planting plan make sure your plants are spaced out properly using your space efficiently we're going to talk about something called multi-cropping, which is a way to get more than one crop off of your raised beds. Um, talk about mulching and watering them. And if you want to extend the season so you can plant earlier and harvest later. And then just different types of vegetables. Some things do better in raised beds. Some things take up more space. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And then we'll just talk about some of the common mistakes to avoid. So. Um, Let's talk about uh, preparing the soil for planting. Well, if you just built your raised beds, it's going to be easy the first year because you just put all this nice loose soil in there. You don't really need to do anything except for rake it, and then it's ready to plant. But in other years, like the year after that, it will compact a little bit from the rain. And so, um, you know, typically you can just take a spading fork, you know, like a, a regular garden fork, and just work up the, 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 the raised bed. Uh, nicely and then rake it out. Um, you know, if you want to use a shovel, you can. Um, you can also use a tool called a broad fork, and that's what this thing here is. Um, it's basically like a big fork. What's nice about it is it's extra wide and it has these two really nice handles so you can hold onto it with either hand, but you step on it and push it into the soil, and sometimes you have to stand on it with your weight, and then you just pull back on the two handles and lift up and it doesn't completely turn the soil over, but it loosens it up. Um, so it's really nice for not disturbing your soil very much, but it, it makes it looser. Um, you can also use a, a rototiller. Um, in a raised bed, you have to use kind of a small rototiller. We have a couple here at our office that are the nice size for that. Because um, you use a very big rototiller, it's hard to control, it's hard to lift up into the raised bed. And if you're not careful, it can run into the sides and um, you know be kind of destructive on your raised bed lumber. So um, have to be careful if you're using a rotor tiller. Um, there's a lot of interest right now in no-till gardening, and uh, 
raised beds make it easier to do no-till gardening. Um, if you're going to do it, I do recommend um, using raised beds if you're going to do no-till gardening. And I do recommend maybe tilling the first time to get the ground loose, uh, unless you're bringing in soil. Um, and then I do recommend mulching um, if you're going to do no-till gardening. That will make it much, much easier. Um, but you can grow um, a good garden if you use a rotor tiller, and you can grow a good garden if you do no-till. Either way, um, the thing about the no-till is you're not disturbing the, the soil layers, and you're not disturb, disturbing the, the microbiological life, you know, things like earthworms and all different, you know, uh, bacteria and fungi that live in the soil. So there's definitely some advantages to no-till. All right, so um, growing in raised beds, it's, you know, just like for any garden, it's good to make a planting plan. And a really good planting plan is gonna tell you all the things you need to know, like when to plant, how much space is needed, you know, like how far apart to put the plants, where to plant um, in, in your garden, how many plants or seeds you're gonna need. Um, and it'll also kind of, help you with your crop rotation because it's always a good idea to rotate your crops. And all that means is by, by category, put the different crops in different places each year. So like if you plant your tomato plants in, in a certain raised bed one year, next year move them to a different raised bed or to a different part of your, your ground plot. Um, so Kansas City Community Gardens has an excellent online garden planning tool. Um, if you're you know, comfortable using a computer, it's really pretty easy to do. Um, if not, you know, you can still get out a piece of graph paper and just measure and make a diagram with your raised beds and basically kind of do the same thing. The nice thing about this planning tool is it does lots of the calculating for you and um, as far as like how much plants and seeds and how far apart to put them. Uh, but it's available on our website under resources. So if you see the tab for resources, Click on that and it will show you the planning tool. Um, so when you're growing in raised bed, it's real important to use proper plant spacing, just like it is in a ground plot. The thing is with a raised bed, um, it's different than a ground plot because you don't have a path between each row. Um, you use what's called equidistant plant spacing, which means um, a plant can be spaced, you know, six inches wide from the next plant and six inches long from the next plant. So they're six inches all around each plant. Um, we actually have a raised bed planting guide. It's available on our website under the resources. And we're gonna look at this a little bit. Um, let me see if I can bring it up here, share the screen on that with it for a minute, look at it closer. All right, so here is the raised bed planting guide. And this tells you how far apart you're gonna have your plants. And so if you're putting out like a broccoli plant right here, it's gonna tell you 15 to 18, 18 inches apart. So that's kind of a, a range. And the thought is that if you're a really good gardener, you're experienced with your raised beds, you're doing everything right, you can probably put them a little closer, even like 15 inches. Um, if you're kind of new to raised bed gardening or gardening in, in general, and you haven't been doing it very much, you're not sure about what you're doing, uh, give it a little more room, go to 18 inches. So somewhere between 15 and 18 inches, that's a how far apart you're gonna put your, your broccoli plants. Um, if you're putting seeds down, it's gonna be a little different. This distance is gonna be the distance that you want to have the plants once they show, once they get start to grow. So you definitely, typically you put down more seeds because they're not all gonna grow. So, you know, like if I'm putting something out like green beans, what I'll do is I'll put two seeds every six inches in my raised bed. And then if they both grow, I'll pull the extra one out. Or if I'm growing corn or something, I'll do the same thing. Um, in the spinach, like what I'll do is I'll make a little row across the raised bed. Not, not the length, but across, and I'll make the rows like four to six inches apart, and then I'll just sprinkle seeds in a little furrow along there. And then once those seeds start to sprout, I'll thin them out where they're about four inches apart. And then because the rows are four inches apart, 
each plant will be about four inches apart, so it works really well. Um, but this raised bed planting guide is really helpful. Um, this was originally adapted from a, um, a Rodale organic gardening book that was produced many years ago. You can still find it in the library. You can find it online. It's just called Growing in Raised Beds, uh, if you want to search for that on the internet. All right, so let's go back to our PowerPoint. Um, there it is. So that raised bed planting guide is available on the website and um, you can print it off. Uh, it's a really great tool for planting and raised beds. Um, so multi-cropping. Um, this is just a way to really use your space efficiently. Let's say you have only two raised beds or one raised bed. And let's say you planted some early cool season vegetables in there. So um, you have a couple options. Let's say you're planting lettuce and spinach like this person did here, and you know, you're gonna harvest them. That's great. And then at some point, you know, it's gonna get warm and they will stop producing and you're gonna pull those plants out. And that will usually be sometime in June. Well, you can do a cool season, cool season cropping plan. So that means you're gonna plant in spring, plant cool season crops. And then you're going to pull them out. And then in late summer or midsummer, like around the end of July, 1st of August, you can plant cool season crops again. So you could plant lettuce again, or you could plant some other cool season crops. You could put carrots, you could put broccoli, um, cabbage, um, arugula, any number of cool season crops you could try there in the fall. In fact, it'd be good to do something different than you did in the spring, but you're going to plant it in late summer. And that's for a fall garden. And we actually will do a whole workshop later coming up here in July on planting a fall garden and how to do that. So, um, so that's one kind of multi-cropping system where you go from a cool season crop to another cool season crop. Um, but there's another type. It's basically where you go from a cool season crop to a warm season crop. So in the same scenario, let's say you plant spinach and lettuce and they're starting to grow and starting to get to be a size where you would want to harvest them. And this bed looks to me like it's ready to harvest. So what you can do then is you can pull out like a whole head of lettuce here, maybe a whole spinach plant here. And then you, in the bare space, you could put in a tomato plant. And in this bare space, put in another tomato plant. You can do the same down here. And so while the spinach and lettuce is still growing and you're still harvesting because you're cutting leaves off, um, you've planted some tomato plants in between that and you could also plant something like um, zucchini squash or yellow squash. You could put pepper plants in there. You could put sweet potato plants in there, but you could still continue to harvest those cool season crops for a while while your warm season crops are starting to get big. And then at some point, your tomato plants or whatever is gonna start getting big. And at that point, your lettuce plants will be done. So you pull out the rest of them. But that allows you to get two whole different crops um, cycles in your raised beds in one season. So that's what we call multi-cropping. Very useful if you don't have very much space in your raised beds. There is a system of gardening you might read about, maybe you've heard about it. You look on the internet, uh, it's called square foot gardening. And uh, I just want you to be aware of it. It's not something that I recommend. And I'll tell you why here in a minute. Basically it's a modified version of raised bed gardening, but the concept means Basically, you divide your raised bed up into little squares. Each one is one square foot, so 12 inches by 12 inches. And their idea is that you're going to grow different things in each one of these squares. You're going to mark them off and grow different things in the squares. And um, I don't know, this was started you know, 25, 30 years ago. There's a particular author who kind of you know, promoted this method. He sold a ton of books, made a ton of money, um, you know, also has an online store selling supplies and things like that. You know, um, I don't see any significant advantage um, using square foot gardening. And in my mind, it has some serious drawbacks, one of which is it's confusing. If you're a beginning gardener, um, you're planting little seeds in these different squares and you don't even know what they're supposed to look like when they come up. It's hard to tell. Um, you know, and not every kind of plant, you know, fits right in a square foot. You know, if you're going to put a squash plant in there. It's going to grow really big and take over, you know, probably this whole half of this raised bed at some point. Um, 
And, you know, they talk about that in the square foot gardening book, you know, planting big things by smaller things, how to do that right. But it just seems really hard and difficult to manage, especially for beginning gardeners. Also, the, the author recommends that you fill your raised bed with an expensive soil mix, you know, that, you know, doesn't even have soil in it. It has peat moss and perlite and uh, vermiculite and different things like that. And you have to add special fertilizer and it's a very expensive mix. So, you know, if you had more than one raised bed, it would be super expensive. Even with one raised bed, it's, it's way too expensive. So I don't recommend it. Um, you can just do square foot gardening. If you want, you can divide your your raised bed up into sections. Maybe like if it's um, if it's 12 feet long, let's see if we can go back to a picture here. Um, uh, well, not finding a good picture of what I'm looking for. I don't know, if this was a raised bed here, you could divide it into a section here that was three feet and this section into another three feet and this one into another three feet. So you could have four different sections in your 12 foot long raised bed um, and, and have different crops in each one of those, but you're gonna be planting solid blocks of plants. So it's just much easier and less confusing and easier to harvest and weed and everything. So, all right, now we're gonna talk about growing in raised beds, mulching. And I recommend mulching you know, if you're doing a ground plot, if you're doing raised beds, if you're doing containers, I cannot stress how important mulching is. And here are just some of the advantages. Um, it's going to reduce the moisture loss, um, especially once you get to hot summer, which happens pretty quick, um, because otherwise that soil, the top two inches of soil is going to get very hot and dry out very quickly. And you're going to spend a lot of time watering. It's going to take more water and your soil is going to get all hard and crusty and your plants are going to suffer because they get so hot and dry in that top two inches. Um, so it's going to reduce the moisture loss. It's going to stay moisture underneath. Um, it's going to cool the soil. You know, when it's, you know, it gets to be 100 degrees out and the sun is shining, that means your soil is, you know, dark. It's going to be like 110, 120 degrees and all the little microorganisms, you know, bacteria, you know, earthworms, little tiny critters that help plants grow and make fertilizer available, etc. That all happens in cooler soil. If it gets too hot, they're not going to do well. So your plants will, will suffer. Um, but the mulch also helps, you know, keep down the weeds. It smothers them, it suppresses the weeds, and then it adds organic matter. At the end of the season in the fall, you could turn that over and mix the mulch in and it will add organic matter to your soil. So just so many good reasons for mulching. Uh, the very first year I had my garden when I was 12 years old, I started mulching with grass clippings and it made taking care of the garden so easy and the garden did so well. It just makes it more likely for a beginning gardener to have success if they're gonna use mulch. As far as to what kinds of mulch, um, one of the easiest is straw because you can buy it in bales. But another really easy one is if you have a lawn and you have a lawn mower that has a grass catching bag on it, uh, a lot of people don't want to catch the grass because it's more work. I like to catch the grass because I like to use it in my garden. And again, this is assuming you're not spraying your lawn with toxic chemicals to kill bugs and kill weeds. Um, so in my yard, I don't do that. So I catch the grass clippings and use them for mulch. Makes really great mulch. Um, so another thing, if you're going to buy something in a bag, I would actually recommend a product called Cotton Burr Compost. It's what's left after they harvest the cotton and then they compost the, the, the crop residue from that and grind it up and it makes a really nice mulch and it looks nice and then it makes a good soil conditioner when you till it in at the end of the year. Um, some people will also use leaves as a mulch. The problem is sometimes leaves will blow away, um, but you know if you run over them with the lawnmower, that's a good way of picking the leaves up from your yard is you know, catch them in with a lawnmower or grass catcher, and then that'll chop them up a little bit. You can put them on your garden uh, or save them until the next year and put them on your garden. And once you wet the leaves down, they tend not to blow away so much. Some people will also use landscape fabric. Um, I think we've got some pictures of some of these, um, and that, that's something you can put down. Um, I do tell people to, again, avoid wood chips, avoid bark, avoid rubber mulch, just not good for paths. 
and not good for the actual raised beds because you don't want to be mixing the wood chips or the rubber mulch in with your soil because you just won't be able to till up your soil later. And you also get splinters from the wood chips and it robs nitrogen out of the soil. So lots of problems there. All right, growing in raised beds, watering the bed. Um, you know, there's different ways to water. Some people just rely on the rain only and that um, works if it rains enough, but often it doesn't. So, um, you know, we typically have to do some irrigation and some people like to use drip irrigation. Uh, you have to set up a drip system, but you still have to monitor that and make sure that it runs long enough to water the roots deep enough. Um, and you know, there's problems with drip irrigation. Sometimes we'll get a leak here or there and you have to make sure the little holes will get clogged up. There's just all kinds of things. So I, I, I appreciate that some people like to do drip irrigation. It's not my favorite form of watering a raised bed. Um, a soaker hose is a modified drip irrigation. You can buy little soaker hose sections and string them around. And that pretty much does the same thing. It's easier to, to deal with a soaker hose than I think a drip irrigation system. Um, but I don't wanna discourage you if you're interested in trying drip irrigation. Some people like to put sprinklers out, but then the problem is if you turn it on, a big sprinkler, you're spending a lot of water on watering your path as opposed to just watering the bed. So yet another way to do it is hand watering, and it does take some time, and most people do not hand water properly. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a minute. But if you're gonna do hand watering, you need some proper equipment. You wanna get a water wand and a water breaker, and of course, you'll need a hose to do that, but you would with any kind of water. Um, as far as how much to water your garden, your raised beds, because they do drain well, they're going to take about an inch to an inch and a half of, of water per week. So I recommend getting a rain gauge, but also um, the rain gauge, if you're putting down water using a, a, a hose and a water breaker, you can use that. It'll tell you how much water you put down. Um, so let's say you get a nice rain, but you go out and you look at your rain gauge and it only measured half an inch and it's hot summer. You're going to need to still add an inch worth of water to get your soil wet all the way down deep, down to the deep roots. Now, when you're just planting and you're putting out seeds and little baby plants, you don't need to water very deep because the roots aren't so deep. But once you get to midsummer, it's hotter. You're going to need to water deeper. That's when you really need to water um, by putting down an inch and a half um, with that. So going to be different in spring than in summer. And so that shallow watering, again, is for young plants, young seeds, young seedlings. Deep watering is for established plants that have been in for a while that have deeper roots. So the question is, how long does it take to water a raised bed? Uh, how many minutes? So um, if you have average water pressure, which is about five gallons per minute, and you can measure this. You get a five gallon bucket, Turn on your hose full blast. It should take about a minute to fill it up if it's five gallons per minute. So that'll give you an idea of your water pressure. Um, but if you have average water pressure and you have a raised bed that's four feet wide by 12 feet long, the size we've been talking about, it's gonna take about six to nine minutes. So if you have your phone on you, you can actually set a timer for yourself so that you'll do it. Um, sometimes it seems like too much water because it's not soaking in fast enough. So what I recommend is if you have two raised beds, is you water one of the raised beds for half that time, like you know three to four and a half minutes, and then you turn around and start doing the other raised bed for three, four and a half minutes, and then you go back to the first bed and do another round of watering for three to four and a half minutes, and then you go back to the second bed, and that way. Um, you'll make sure that you're getting lots of water and it's soaking in. So um, it takes a while. It takes a good six to nine minutes to water a raised bed that's dry. So you want to make sure you're watering enough. But you're only going to do this once a week. People, if they're not mulching, think they have to water sometimes every day because the soil dries out every day in the hot summer. And so they'll water just a little bit every day, but the water never goes down deep enough. And so that's not good for your plants so they won't get deep roots. All right, we're almost finished here, just like a little bit more to wrap up here. Um, raised beds are also make it easier to extend the growing season. 
And what that means is you can use some row cover uh, to put over your raised bed uh, to, so you can plant earlier in the spring when it's colder. Um, now, again, you have to plant cool season crops that can take the cold, but that'll give you about four to five degrees of protection. And so your seedlings will come up earlier. They'll start growing quicker. If you put out little transplants, they'll grow quicker. Um, sometimes you get a cold snap here like we did just last week. We had a temperatures down to 32 and uh, we had some snow. Um, so if you have row cover, that will help protect it from the cold. So row cover is very lightweight fabric. You can buy it um, in a roll, buy it on the internet. Most garden centers don't really carry it. Um, or if they do, they don't carry multiple sizes. We sell it by the foot here. So if you want to buy like 12 foot for your 12 foot raised bed, you can do that. Um, if you want to buy 100 feet for a long row out in your garden, you can do that. Um, so you can buy it by the foot. Um, or you can buy it on the internet. Typically, there's different thicknesses. Um, the really lightweight is not so much for frost protection, although it will give some frost protection. The lightweight also is used to keep insects out, so it acts like a screen. Um, so if you're trying to keep out um, cabbage butterflies, cabbage loopers that will be chewing on your cabbage and broccoli and collard plants, you can use a really lightweight row cover. Um, so there's a medium row cover um, that's more for temperature protection, and then there's a heavier row cover that's for extra, extra heavy protection of, you know, in real time. Um, so anyhow, you can put hoops up if you want, and that will uh, allow for the plants not to have weight on them. Um, but the, low, the row cover is very lightweight. The plants can actually support and will lift the row cover up. You just have to make sure that you put enough slack on. So there's different ways to fasten it down. Um, some people will use like bricks or boards. Um, some people will use little clips to fasten it to the little plastic hoops. So there's lots of different ways to fasten it down. Sometimes people will use like a landscape fabric pin uh, to pin it down also. You can actually overwinter some crops. We've been doing this for several years now in the Beanstalk Children's Garden where we'll plant some kale or spinach for collard greens late, later than we would normally. And we have baby plants, you know, growing in October, November, December, but underneath the, the row cover, they're growing slowly. And you can go out and pick some really nice spinach, really nice kale, really nice collard greens in January, February and March, which is something that's really welcome, you know, for the garden. Uh, so it's something definitely worth trying. Um, to overwinter some crops. It's really fun to do. Um, all right, so growing different types of crops, you know, a lots of times, you know, if you only have one or two raised beds, it probably makes the most sense to use that, those beds to grow small space vegetables. So these are going to be things that don't take up very much room. Think of like your leafy greens, um, onions, spinach, peas, a lot of your cool season crops. Because um, they don't take up very much room. And also, um, sometimes in the springtime, the, the ground plot is kind of muddy and it's hard to get dry enough to plant it. So if you use your, your limited raised bed space for your cool season crops, it works really well. But you can also put warm season crops in there. So things that take up more space, like if you have enough raised bed space, you can put peppers, you can put tomatoes. And even viney crops, things like squash, and cucumbers, and melons, um, they will spread far. And people say, oh, that doesn't work good in a raised bed. But you can let you can let them crawl out into the aisles if that's OK with you, and you can still get around them. Um, sweet potatoes do pretty well in raised beds. Um, so refer back to that raised bed plant spacing guide to know how far apart to put the different crops. Um, you know, sometimes some people will say, oh, corn is a waste of, you know, your raised bed space. But if you had enough raised bed space, you can certainly grow corn in there and okra, even though they get tall. You just want to make sure you don't plant them too close to your little tiny crop where they're going to shade them out. So you can also grow perennial crops, meaning crops that are going to be in the garden for a long period of time. 
think of things like fruits, like um, raspberries, uh, blackberries, um, bush cherries, and strawberries all do really well in raised beds. Um, here in the left, you see some um, raspberries that have been grown in a raised bed and they're grown on a trellis there. Um, but also um, perennial crops like asparagus, um, rhubarb, um, and herbs, different perennial herbs like sage and thyme and chives and all those things, which you know go from season to season. So um, you know, raised beds really work well for all of that. Um, they're really very versatile. Um, but if you had limited raised bed space, I would use it on the smaller crops and then plant your your big, wide spreading crops, mining crops in ground plots if you had limited raised bed space. All right, so now we're finishing up here with just common mistakes to avoid. Um, and so, um, you know, one is making the beds too wide so you can't reach to the middle very easily. And that's gonna make you more likely to wanna to walk on the raised bed. Um, if you are gonna use lumber, you know, you definitely have to at least, you know, put brackets on them or use those concrete block holders that we talked about or um, notch the joints and put them together that way. But just putting them together with screws and nails and not notching the joints and not using brackets um, is not gonna work well. Um, you know, another common mistake is just using any kind of soil. And I don't mean your existing soil, I mean like buying topsoil from some company that claims to be a topsoil company, but it's just soil they got from some farm field or where they were building some houses and you don't know what you're getting. You could get a lot of clay mixed in there. You could get a lot of seeds, weed seeds mixed in there. Um, so it's really better to buy from a reputable company and specifically buy that mix of half compost and half topsoil. Um, another mistake that people make is not filling the beds up full enough. I see that all the time. Lots of times people will only fill them up about halfway because it's so much work to you know, get all that soil in there. But you really want to have a deep root zone for your plants. So you want to fill them up almost to the top and then they will settle a little bit and you'll need to add a little bit as time goes by. But fill them up pretty full. I usually say when you're starting out, fill them up to the top and then let them settle in a little bit. Now the mistake of course is walking in the beds because um, you're going to pack that soil down and just make it harder for the plants to grow. And then improper plant spacing, either putting things too close together or too far apart. Because if you're putting them too far apart, you're not making good use of your your your, your space because you only got limited space in that raised bed. And then of course not watering long enough, just watering the top of the soil for a couple minutes. And you need to water that raised bed for six to nine minutes to get it fully wetted. And then of course not rotating your crops, um, you know, is a mistake. Especially tomatoes, you want to move them around to a different place. And even if you only have two raised beds at least move from one raised bed to the other every other year. And that will help your tomatoes not build up with diseases and raised beds. Um, so yeah, we talk more about crop rotation in our vegetable gardening basics workshop, which is also available online if you want to go back and look at that. Um, and then the last mistake here is um, putting landscape fabric in the bottom. Sometimes people think you just got to do that or it's going to, the grass is going to take over. But, um, that's going to stop your plant roots from going down as deep as they should. And so really recommend not doing landscape fabric. And of course, this bed here, they made it way too wide because you're not going to be able to reach to the middle of that. So you're going to be walking in that raised bed if you're going to be planting things in it. So it really is better to make it narrower, about four feet. So these are all the common mistakes. So since raised beds are kind of a big project, it's better to avoid making these mistakes and not having to fix them later. And so it's just better to do it right the first time. So um, I think that's it for our presentation. And uh, we'll check with Rob and find out if he has some questions for us that people have submitted. Yes, we do have about, looks like six questions, Ben. Um, I am going to send this to the printer. And if you want to go pick that up, I will sure. do a yeah. quick uh, tour of the website for some of these resources. Okay, great. 
Yes. Great. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, um, so you're on our homepage here. Uh, if you go to the resource uh, tab right here and go down to how to videos, this is where um, you can get any recordings of our virtual workshops this year. Um, I'll click on there and it should load. And I'll try to have this workshop up within a day or two. And then underneath each workshop video, there's a, a PDF of the PowerPoint. Um, also under resources, if you go to these PDF guide sheets and go to gardening guide sheets, um, you'll have various uh, PDFs here, including the guides that Ben was talking about on raised beds, like materials, construction guide, spacing guide right here, um, watering, all kinds of good stuff here, planting calendar, soil testing. And then um, he mentioned this planting plan tool. This is also under resources. And then this is our uh, planting plan page. And it gives you um, some detailed instructions. And there's even a video, a how-to video on um, how to use it. So, um, all right, that's all I have been. I'll stop sharing my screen and you can go ahead and answer your questions. Okay. Um... So um, the first question was, does using the, the cinder blocks, the concrete blocks, does that affect the soil pH balance that you would have to worry about that? And that is a legitimate concern because, you know, they're made out of, there's limestone material in there and that will raise the pH up higher. Um, so they do recommend if you're going to use cinder blocks to wash them off first using a hose. That will just remove kind of the loose um, limestone that might be attached to that. Um, beyond that, they say you just probably need to check the soil pH, you know, every two or three years. And if the pH does start to climb a little bit, um, then you might need to add a little bit of sulfur. But generally, it's not a problem. So, um, but they do recommend washing them off first. Um, the next question was, please explain how to mulch to prevent the soil from washing away. So. Um, I assume we're talking about the kind of raised beds that have soil on the sides. And so in that case, you just have to um, go back to, let me see if I can bring that up here again. Um, For some reason, it's frozen. Oh, now I just made it totally disappear. Well, anyhow, um, as far as just mulching, you're just going to take some of that mulch and put it on the sides of the raised beds. And you put it down thick enough, like two to three inches thick, and that will stop the, the soil from washing away. Um, so it really is just a question of doing that. The other thing I do is I tamp the soil a little bit on the sides of the raised beds, just pack it with your hands, and, and then um, you put the mulch down over the top of that. And then, of course, you're trying not to, um, you know, like overwater in that area and use a gentle watering tool um, and it won't wash the mulch away. So that will help it from the soil from mulching, from washing away, and the mulch from washing away. All right. So, um, the next question was, do I recommend filling the bottom of the bed with logs or wood chips to cut the soil cost? And I would say no. Um, now, I, somebody might be talking about like if you're making a double stack um, and, um, you know, I can see people might be concerned it's just going to take a lot of soil to fill that up. But it really is worth it because you've spent the money on the lumber. Um, the soil is not the biggest part of the cost. The lumber is the bigger cost. The, the soil is fairly cheap. I recommend just filling it all the way with soil. Um, the other thing is that lumber or logs or wood chips in the bottom is going to decompose eventually. And um, I think it will help steal nitrogen out of the soil. Um, so I'm just not a big fan of putting the wood stuff in the bottom of the raised bed. Um, some people even asked about, can you use like the, the plastic peanuts things that they sell or that come in when you get packages and don't recommend using that. I really recommend just filling it with soil 
and it will cost a little bit more, but not that much more. Um, and you'll just have really, really good garden because you're going to have really good deep soil. All right, so this person has a question about groundhogs. Um, and groundhogs can be a problem. They said they trapped one last year, but there are more. Um, they were eating their cabbage plants, and they even had chicken wire around. Um, that is a tough one. Groundhogs can be a big problem. Um, I have not had that much problem with groundhogs. Um, other things also do a lot more eating typically than groundhogs do, but they go eat some garden plants. Um, the, the only system I know is the live trapping system um, or calling an animal control company, a private company to come and set the traps for you if you don't want to do the trap. Um, so trapping is complicated and there's some legal restrictions on it. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot. I will do a class later on animal pests and we'll probably go into more detail. Um, the other thing I have heard people doing is if you find the groundhog's hole where he goes into the ground and you turn the garden hose on it and fill it up with water and flood it, he'll be less likely to want to stay in that location. Um, so that's another thing you could try. Um, and the last question is, does planting summer and winter crops in the same bed count as crop rotation or you still need to rotate? Um, I would still rotate crops specifically if you were going to um, for tomatoes, because um, tomatoes are probably the, the crop that needs rotation the most. Uh, to a lesser degree, things like squash and cucumbers, and then close after that would be members of the cabbage and broccoli family. So it really is you're <coughs> excuse me you're trying to avoid putting your tomatoes in the same place each year. So if you plant a little something in between, that doesn't really mean that you are avoiding the tomato diseases that might be building up in the soil. So really thinking that um, you want to try and at least put them in a different spot the following year. I, I knew a person once, that all they had was one raised bed. So they said, well, what do I do? I said, well, in one year you put it in half the raised bed, the next year you put it in the other half of the raised bed. And that is not perfect, it's less than ideal, but it's better than not rotating your crops at all. Um, so, but as far as like things like with lettuce and spinach, um, you know, arugula, there's, you know, if you have to plant the same thing in the same place the following year, it's not as big a deal. It really is more about tomatoes and the members of the cucumber and squash family um, that are a problem with that. So that's all the questions I had. I don't know if you got any more that came in, Rob. Nope, looks like that's it. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. And good luck with your gardening. Uh, in case you don't know it, right now is about time to plant tomatoes and peppers. Uh, so this week, the 10-day forecast is looking good. Uh, if you went and planted your tomato plants you know, two weeks ago, you're probably in trouble because they probably died when we had the frost. Um, unfortunately, lots of places start selling them too early. So we try not to sell ours too early. We're going to start doing it later on this week. And uh, you can check out our website for information about our plant sales. All right. Thanks, everybody.